Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this forum event co-sponsored by the British Society for the Philosophy of Science on free will. I mean, we all take it for granted, I think, as we go through life, that we can make decisions in which various different options are open to us, and we get to control which option we take. You know, you got to choose whether or not to come to this event this evening or not. You could have not come to the event. You know, I can choose right now whether or not to lift up my right hand or my left hand. There we go, did the right hand. And that was within my control. And as we go through life, we, have, we plot our own course by making these various conscious choices. But what if that's all completely wrong? I mean, philosophers have been debating for thousands of years the possibility that that might all be completely wrong and that the choices we make are really determined by facts we don't control, fixed far in advance of our births. But over recent decades, that debate has been transformed in, in exciting ways by our growing understanding of the neuroscience and cognitive science of human decision-making, a growing understanding of what is going on inside the human brain when someone makes a decision, like whether to raise their right hand or their left hand. And this field of the neuroscience of agency has had ramifications that have spilled over into philosophy and the law and ethics and all kinds of other areas, raising fascinating questions. I mean, questions like, is ultimately everything we do the product of unconscious brain processes that are beyond our control? In other words, has neuroscience shown free will to be a kind of illusion? What happens to moral and criminal responsibility if it turns out that a defendant can always argue, my brain made me do it. You know, if they can always tell a story about how a neurological or psychiatric condition led them to do what they did, um, rather than the, the act resulting from their free will. And when we pin down the sense in which we do have free will, if, if we have it at all, is that something that is unique to humans? Or is it something that we might share with other non-human animals, uh, and if so, which animals? And it's a pleasure to be joined this evening by three panelists from different fields who are going to bring their expertise to bear on these questions. They are Helen Stewart, philosopher from the University of Leeds, uh, Matthew Broom, psychiatry expert from the University of Birmingham, and Nura Sidaris, a neuroscientist from the Ecole Normale Supérieure. Um, and let's start with you, Nura. I mean, you're sort of on the front line, in a way, doing the neuroscience, finding out what is going on in people's brains when they make decisions. Your work in particular concerns this idea of a sense of agency. And can you tell us what, a, what the sense of agency is, what it is you're actually trying to study here? <clears throat> Yes, so in uh, my uh, work, what we mean by the sense of agency is our sense of being in control of our actions and through our actions of being in control of events in the external world. So the fact that we can choose different actions in order to uh, change uh, things in the world. Um, and so we try to study how this experience of being in control of our actions and their consequences comes about. And so we do studies where we assess how different uh, types of manipulations uh, that we might do to the situation uh, in which people can act uh, and how that in turn changes how people feel in control. And can you give us an example of the kind of studies you've been, been doing? Uh, yes, so for example, during my PhD uh, here at UCL, uh, we used uh, subliminal priming, uh, so uh, stimuli that are presented very, very quickly and so people don't uh, see them consciously. Um, and people uh, had to make, uh, choose whether to make a left or a right hand action. Um, and before that, we would show these subliminal primes, which could be arrows to the left or the right. Um, and then we would see how um, after people made an action and saw different types of consequences of their actions, how they would report uh, their feeling of control over the consequences of their actions. So for example, they might press the right button and see a red colored circle, uh, or if they press the let bu left button, they might see a green colored circle. And so they would have to judge how much control they felt over these different colors, which were differently related to the actions they were making. Um, and then what we tried to see was how this changing the ease or difficulty of making the action 
uh, pressing the left or the right hand button through these subliminal primes, which were arrows to the left or the right, how would that change uh, people's sense of agency? So essentially, if the primes would point to the right, for example, and then people made a right hand action, that would be easier to uh, respond, and so people would also be faster. And then they tended to rate uh, feeling more in control over the consequences of their actions than when making the action was difficult because the subliminal primes that they didn't see consciously were uh, to the opposite direction of the action that they actually made. And so the idea here was that how easy or difficult it is to uh, make actions or even decisions might uh, lead us to feel more or less in control over the consequences of our actions. Um, so seeing the... Seeing the arrow pointing a particular way leads to this feeling of control over which button you press. Well, uh, or at least seeing the action, seeing the prime pointing in a particular direction would make the action easier, mm. and easier actions uh, would tend to be associated with more control. So the general sort of thrust here, I, I take it, is that the, this sense of feeling in control can actually come apart, really, from whether we really are in control or yes, not, or in what some cases on the screen. Yes, uh, in, in some cases. So here what we were seeing is people uh, might feel a bit more or a bit less in control as a function of uh, these influences, basically just how easy or difficult they felt that it was to make an action. Um, and they might not necessarily realize that that is factoring into their uh, experience of control. But it uh, are, uh, at least hypothesis, is that this comes because in everyday life, normally when we are in situations where we know how our actions relate to their consequences, if things are easy to do, if uh, our actions flow uh, easily, then things tend to go according to plan and the outcomes that we expect tend to follow. So the idea would be this is a bit of a heuristic uh, that we've learned through our lives that when uh, our decision making goes easily, things tend to come uh, as, as we expect and therefore we tend to be more in control. So we feel um, a sense of control, a sense of agency when actions play out as we've predicted. Yes, exactly. Um, and so other research had also shown that if the outcomes that we expect of our actions, for example, in the study that I've mentioned, if I've learned that if, after I press the right button, I get a red uh, circle, uh, then if I get the red circle, I tend to feel more in control than if I were to get another circle that I didn't learn was related to that action. So if the outcomes of our actions match our predictions, we also tend to feel more in control than if they don't. Um, mm. And let's talk a bit about the, the Libet experiments, because right? in a way that's sort of a foundational paradigm right, in, the, in the neuroscience of free will. Yes. Um, you want to tell us a bit about the, the original experiments there and how they've been updated? Yes, so um, in uh, the 70s and 80s, uh, Benjamin Libet was uh, looking at how people uh, make decisions and how when they become aware of the time that they've made the decision to act. So he would uh, ask participants to press a button uh, and while they were watching a clock. And they did this while they were uh, connected to an electroencephalogram uh, machine, which was recording uh, the electrical potentials at the scalp. Um, and the idea then was to try to look at how the brain activity uh, changed over time in relation to when people acted. And when the brain uh, might start to show activity that would index that they are preparing to make an action relative to the time that people would judge that they've made the decision to act. So participants had to just decide to press a button whenever they felt like it. Um, but they were looking at this rotating clock um, and they would be asked to report the time at which uh, the position of the clock when they made the decision to act not when they acted, or in other cases they might decide to uh, indicate the time when they acted, or in the critical, what was called the W time, was the time of the will, when people intended to make the action. Um, and so then he could uh, look at the event-related potential, so the EG signal relative to the moment at which people press the button, and looked at how activity in the brain changed before that, and when people's reports of their time of uh, the urge to make an action uh, appeared. And what those studies showed is that basically people tended to report uh, the time of uh, the will to act about 200 milliseconds before they pressed the button. 
Uh, but uh, the brain activity actually started to rise uh, about 500, uh, 550 milliseconds before they pressed the button, which means that would be about a 300 millisecond gap between the beginning of the brain activity, uh, reflecting the preparation of the action, and the time of uh, re reported conscious will. So intuitively, you sort of you'd expect that you make the conscious decision and then the brain starts preparing the action. Exactly. And in fact, we find it, it's not that, that way at all. You know, the brain is preparing the action almost half a second before you're consciously aware of having decided what to do. Yes, uh, that was uh, what the results uh, seemed to show. And the, yeah, the previous hypothesis would be that first you would see the time of uh, the conscious will, and then you would have uh, brain preparation. So this posed for Libet uh, uh, seems to pose a problem for uh, notions of free will, where the idea would be that the conscious intention should precede the brain activity, as it seemed like the brain activity was preceding the conscious intention. And this, and was, this was the classic 80s results. Right? And, yes. and what about since then? I mean, have things got worse for free will or better? <laughs> well, uh, more recently in 2008, there was an, an fMRI study, functional magnetic resonance imaging study, uh, then in Berlin where people were also asked to make either left or right hand actions um, and report the time at which they decided to choose uh, while some uh, letters were uh, switching on the screen. And there what they, had f what they found was that brain activity uh, eight seconds or even 10 seconds before the time at which people made the action was predictive of which action they were going to make. So mm. about eight or 10 seconds before people acted, we could find a uh, brain activity uh, which would tell us whether they were going to later press a left or a right hand button. And still the time of their conscious intention would have been about 500 milliseconds before. Now, uh, it's worth noting that the pr this uh, activity predicted which action they were going to make at about 60 uh, or less than 60% chance. So it wasn't that eight seconds before, it was 100% the case that they were going to press a button or the other. So the and further back in time you go from, from the action, the harder it is to predict what the decision will be. Yes. But you're still getting some predictive power eight seconds before the person thinks they've decided. Yes. It, with exactly the kind of decisions I, I thought I'd made at the, at the beginning of this event, whether to use the right hand or the left hand. Mm -hmm. It can be predicted to some extent eight seconds ahead. Exactly. So what these studies seem to suggest and would be consistent with other uh, research and decision making and, and how our brains, uh, uh, the brain activity uh, relates to our decision making, the idea would be that our brain tends to prepare or will have uh, a tendency, uh, for example, to go one way or the other, and that will then help us to make the decision uh, one way or the other. Um, but it remains more of an open question, or at least the methods that we have at the moment don't allow us to say that the brain activity at this point definitely will cause a given action in the mm. future. It's just uh, it increases the probability of going one way or the other. Um, so, so it's not yet like the film Minority Report, right? Where, right. where they can predict perfectly what people will do. Exactly. But yes, we're not there. Just, just some predictive power. You know, leading some people right to, to say that what this science is showing is that free will is an illusion. Because you've got these two types of challenge that you've, you've set out. You know, there's our decisions being influenced by all kinds of things we don't think they're being influenced by, like whether an arrow is flashed before our eyes. And then you've got this other type of evidence that seems to be showing that the brain has already set the action in motion maybe eight seconds ahead, or at least half a second ahead. And put those together, some people say, it seems like we don't have free will in the sense we, we thought we did. I mean, do you agree with that? Uh, well, uh whether one agrees or with that or not basically depends on the definition of free will one uses. And uh, often in this discussion, the issue is that the bar changes quite a lot for uh, different uh, people. So on some definitions of free will, uh, the main question is whether if the world is uh, set uh, with deterministic rules and therefore if brain activity will be a causal determinant of what will happen uh, next and our decisions and our actions, then that's not possible uh, to have free will. Um, then 
uh, well, when, when some views, uh, those two things are, are not compatible because the decisions for them to be free would have to not be caused by uh, other things in the past. Um, but other people define free will in different ways uh, in which that is a possibility still. Um, I guess what seems to matter so to me when I think about free will is just this idea that there's got to be different options open to us. Right. It's got to be that I could have raised my left hand. I raised my right hand, but it could have been the left. Yes. It seems like that that's challenged if, if seconds before I made the decision, bits of the brain that are independent of my conscious decision have kind of made the decision for me. Right. Well, uh, as, as many... Uh, critics have raised the evidence, at least that is present at the moment, does not allow us to say that the fact that your brain activity was, had a tendency one way or the other, eight or 10 seconds before means you will act in a given way later. Therefore, you would still have room to make different types of decisions later on. So just like influences in our decisions coming from subliminal primes or contextual information or social pressure, all of those things can influence our decisions. Uh, but that doesn't mean they determine our decisions fully. So there can still be some uncertainty of which way things will go. Um, and um, yes. Um, Good. I mean, let's bring in uh, Helen and, and Matthew on this. I mean, particularly Helen, as a philosopher, you must worry about I do. I've spent the best part of the last 20 years worrying about free will, I think. <laughs> so yes, I do. I do worry about it. One thing I'm interested in, Noura, is to ask you, I mean, one, one of the things philosophers often say about these cases, the experimental cases, is that the actions are always, in a sense, artificial. You know, they're, right. will it be this button, will it be that button, shall I raise my right hand, shall I raise my left hand? And I understand why they have to be like that, because, of course, the experimental setup has, has got to be very well defined, uh, lots of constraints have to be in place, and so on. Do you think it makes a difference um, that the actions are the very simple, this one, that one, um, kind of uh, examples um, mm. that, that we get in the, in the neurophysiological literature? Do you think the, the conclusions can be safely extrapolated to, you know, the sorts of things I guess we're worried about, you know, the decisions we make which are actually, which affect our lives and which are based on, you know, principles and values and things like that? Yes, I think you raise a very good uh, and important criticism uh, of these studies in trying to make, at least in being used to make the argument that we don't have free will based on the fact, uh, on very, very simplistic uh, and somewhat irrelevant uh, choices. In fact, also in these cases, uh, for example, biasing people's decisions is easy if the decisions are irrelevant. So in, our, in the study that we were doing, for example, participants had no particular reason to press the left or the right button, or in some cases they had to follow an instruction, and so it just, the primes made it easier or difficult. But if they were choosing, even if they were biased, they were making irrelevant choices. So, of course, um, I, I don't think it's quite so safe to extrapolate uh, that it, it, it's exactly the same for much more complex decisions. But it, in, in part, it's because of the complexity, I think. Uh, as complexity of the decisions and decision making and uh, deliberation goes up, there are more and more uh, steps in which uh, different types of influences and possibly uh, the effects of our own thinking uh, and our own reasoning uh, will influence uh, our decisions. Um, so even if we don't always choose whether we're pressing the le left or the right hand button, we might be able to choose other things about uh, our lives. Um, mm -hmm. Matthew? I suppose I had a couple of thoughts as, as, as Nora was talking. I guess one was whether this was a wider example of our irrationality. So mm. some of the work I've been involved with is comparing delusions with normal beliefs. And one of the things you can learn quite quickly is that a lot of our own beliefs are pretty irrational. So I guess thinking about Kahneman and the wider work, we're all susceptible to nudges and biases and prejudices. So I guess is this conception of free will uh, of a wider view that we're all a bit more rational than we think we are? And secondly, I think this came out of the discussion with you, between you and Jonathan, is that this is quite a technical area. I guess the worry I have is when the neuroscience gets translated into policy or practice, when it's not quite there. And I guess if we're debating what the experiments mean, then somebody who's maybe making policy or making laws or making judgments in a court, and I might come on to that, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a straightforward translation from science to practice as yet. 
I guess I'm interested in the kind of the neuro hype element, mm-hmm. where they think some of the data gets taken too far mm-hmm. outside of neuroscience. Uh, sure, uh, I think in some cases it, it does. I think there's quite a lot of value in thinking, uh, and the reason why uh, I, I work on this issue is I think there's a lot we can learn about how much control we can have and how we can understand our feeling of control and that maybe also understanding, um, becoming more aware uh, of, our, of the limitations or of the biases in our decision making. Like a lot of the research on, on uh, biases and heuristics indeed shows that if people become aware or are made aware of these biases, they can then uh, start to counteract them, mm-hmm. which means that people then can make freer choices than, than uh, before because they are aware of how they might be influenced. That's a nice question. So neuroscience could actually enhance freedom by right? education. Good exactly. moral philosophy <laughs> idea. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's the motivation for doing this research. Uh, I think there, re- there are things to contribute. But, of course, it has to be... Uh, taken in the right way, and so the fact that these uh, results have been shown would not necessarily uh, directly translate into uh, practical things, or people at least need to think about that carefully, of how it can translate into the legal system um, or not. Matthew, assuming some crimes, the nature of the crime really is quite a lot like pressing a button, you know, pulling a trigger, something like that. Were you in control or not when you pulled the trigger? Yeah. Sometimes the policemen... uh, who've shot dead a suspect, their defense is that I was just following my training, I didn't have time to think. But do you think there's, there's room, in some cases perhaps, for this kind of work to I think be quite directly so. relevant? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a difficult one, and we were discussing it beforehand. Um, so uh, the English legal system certainly has different gradations of viewing this kind of evidence, thinking about responsibility. And uh, the most extreme is the so-called McNaughton rules, which is a defence against um, homicide. And that's when you don't know the you don't know the nature of the quality of the act, and you don't know that it's wrong. So that's really just being completely unaware of what you're doing, and that's only permissible as a defence against murder. Um, the most more common defence is one called diminished responsibility, which is where, um, again, the the law kind of uses terms like substantial impairment of mind, due to either I think illness, injury, or development that impairs decision making. So you can kind of see how Noah's work could impact on the meaning of those words, and the definitions of those words, and how it interface with the legal system. Yes, yeah, so I think it is beginning to happen. Certainly, I think colleagues I've worked on, worked on some of the topics in the US say it is beginning to enter the US judicial system. It's a topic that the law will have to grapple with. Yeah. Uh, good, well, well, we'll come back to that. But for now, I'd like to take a few questions from the audience on this topic of the neuroscience of free will. Uh, if there are any. It'd be particularly good to take two or three questions in a single block. Let's first go to third row from the back. Um, I believe it's someone's free will to have their freedom to pursue happiness, which the US Constitution, for instance, grants its citizens. However, that one individual's happiness, if it inevitably endangers the life of another, I would like to give a graphic dirty example. If a man rapes a woman, he's pursuing his sexual pleasure. He has every right to do that. But by doing so, he's damaging someone uh, by robbing them of their free will or choice. Um, How do you, as philosophers, as legal practitioners, um, would say where that boundary is being superseded and where the law can also, as you were mentioning, the law gives different gray areas. Um, And in this country, sadly, I've learned that um, the police says it's up to the victim to prove that someone has been raped. And the rapist can easily say, I didn't rape that person. In fact, no sexual activity ever took place. And the law cannot touch that person. So I would like the panel to please shed some light on it, particularly with this instance that I've mentioned. Because coming from the East, or coming from the cultural or religious background, there are very clear demarcations. And there's very clear punishment. If you do that, the rapist 
prove it or not but if there's genuine belief they would say all right you are going for the death penalty so they established justice then and there not to encourage another ever to encroach that freedom of someone else thank you thanks yeah a complex issue we'll, we'll come back to the panel after the next couple of questions and let's have uh, a question from the front row here and then we'll go back to the second row from the back, and then we'll come back to the <coughs> Thanks very much. Uh, just on the question of the Libet experiments, um, many philosophers, as you know, are quite skeptical of the anti-free will conclusion because they would say, okay, what this might show is that we're only, on some occasions, conscious of our reasons for making a decision or of our making a decision uh, slightly after we actually make it. It doesn't follow from that that we don't freely make it. Um, and some critics uh, will say, well, the alternative view suggests a, a sort of ghost-in-the-machine view of agency, such that the real you is, is either epiphenomenal or, or doesn't causally interact at all, which seems totally against our experience of freedom. And, you know, and finally, I mean, there's a, as, as again, it's familiar, there's, a, there's a, a tradition in philosophy called compatibilism that says that really it's enough to be, you're free if you are able to act unimpeded on your rational uh, choices. It's the it's responsiveness to reasons, not necessarily consciousness, conscious responsiveness to reasons that make for free will. I mean, a very complex issue, but I wonder where you stand on that. Great, thanks. And the third question from the second row from the back there. Um. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pose the question, what cognitive biases do you think there exist um, in our conceptions of free will inherently uh, to the panel? Thank you. Great, thanks. So three really interesting questions. I mean, one, this complex issue of balancing people's right to express their free will against other rights in a legal system, perhaps with particular reference to rape cases. Um, this issue of whether responding to reasons is enough for free will and whether you need to be conscious of those reasons, I think is a fascinating question. Whether it's okay that the consciousness of the reasons comes after the, the responding to them and this issue of whether our ways of thinking about free will are themselves uh, affected by cognitive biases. Um, I mean, welcome comments on any of those three questions. Perhaps, uh, Helen, would you like to come in? Um, yes, I was very taken by what this gentleman said in the front here. I, I very much uh, would agree with that. I think one thing that we have to bear in mind is that what's perhaps the sort of, I don't know, philosopher's image of free will where you have conscious decision followed by bodily movement and the conscious decision is what gives freedom to the action what makes it the thing the case that it came from me that's uh, just reflection on some very ordinary cases makes one realize that that's utterly untenable I mean one example that I like to talk about is speaking if you think about what I'm doing now I mean it's it's a kind of activity that I feel fully responsible for. I take responsibility for what I say. I'm free insofar as I'm free in anything I do. I'm free when I speak. But one doesn't think that, you know, each each word I speak is preceded by a conscious decision to speak that word or, or that each sentence is like that. Yeah. Speech just flows without prior conscious decision. Um, so I think the model, according to which freedom requires this prior conscious event, is wrong. And when one sees it's wrong, one can take the line that I think this gentleman wanted to take with the Libet experiments and say, uh, so what if the, if the beginnings of action are, are unconscious? That's so those okay. Experiment, those experimental results come to seem less surprising. Yes. Once you abandon the picture of free will as involving conscious decision, then exactly action. that. Yes. Right. Um, any thoughts on the on the other issues? I mean, Matthew, do you have any thoughts um, on this sort of legal question? Yes, I guess I'll speak as a, as a psychiatrist, Alex, not a, a legal professional. But I guess on the issue of uh, of that in relation to free will, I guess each jurisdiction has its own threshold for evidence and culpability and legal threshold. And I agree with what you say empirically, it might be the case that some rape cases aren't very well prosecuted or convicted in, in the UK jurisdiction. This is the wider issues of, of uh, free will. I guess 
the connection in that issue might be around issues of consent and whether the person themselves will make a psychiatric defence or criminal defence of their actions. Um, it, it, it touched on, on wider things, which you might, we may come on to again, that um, uh, having a medical explanation or account of the action doesn't necessarily lead to a different um, outcome for the person. So in many ways, in, in actual clinical practice, a lot of my patients would strive not to let a psychiatrist anywhere near the defence stand in a court. But the reason being is that psychiatric disposal, as the law lawyers call it, meaning rather than go from a, a prison to a psychiatric hospital, can have a longer duration of time. So they actually want to, um, want to not be considered as having a psychiatric condition? Yes. In terms of our, our colleague over there, I mean, I guess, um, I think Nura kind of demonstrated it slightly in her empirical report is that they actually the one, the, the stimulus that was you were primed to respond to was the one you felt most free in acting. So I think we do tend to all overestimate our own self-efficacy and responsibility. Um, and I guess you see that again in, in, in psychopathology with those who are, who are depressed are probably better able, better able to accurately judge their own performance and abilities than those of us who are not. So we tend to have a more optimistic and positive bias about our own abilities in our future than is warranted by evidence. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that in mind, I mean, let's think more about places where neuroscience and psychiatry meets the law. A right? uh, particular interest of yours, Matthew. And this idea of a my brain made me do it defense. Yeah. I mean, do you think there are some cases in which that, that can genuinely be a defense? Uh, it, it, it can be, and they're the ones that are in the textbooks that people, people um, uh, talk about. They're pretty unusual, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm honest. And usually as a clinician, you, you kind of uh, <coughs> are aware that not, it's not quite right. Usually, I guess because the reasons that, I guess, Helen and Nura brought up, a criminal act is usually a very complex act evolving over time. And the brain, when impaired, tends to err uh, towards quite simple, repetitive, stereotyped action. So if I kind of, so when a brain's going wrong, it kind of acts mm. like new epilepsy. So you talk about stereotype repetitive action. So people who will say, my brain made me do a complex, purposeful event of holding over time, it's usually, most clinicians would say, mm, that doesn't quite fit the way the body works. Can you give an example where you, where you think there has been a legitimate sort of defense? Well, one people would talk about in textbooks would be what's called insane automatisms. So automatism is where you have a, a, a complex, what I've said, a complex mode of action over time. And a classic example would be sort of sleepwalking in the context of a complex epileptic seizure. But they're very unusual. And again, the way to determine that would be an EEG recording to determine if they were actually in, in the stage of sleep appropriate. The reason why it's very rare is that when you're in a very deep stage of sleep where you're dreaming, your muscles are usually paralysed. So the fact that usually if people say, I was in a deep state of sleep, I slept, walk, I, 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 I sleepwalked, murdered my partner, usually that's uh, biologically implausible. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are cases though, right, exactly. where sleepwalking has been successfully yeah. used as a yeah, defense. Exactly, it's a very rare. Um, yeah. So you think it, do you think that's sort of bogus or the, 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 there might be genuine cases? No, it can be genuine, it can be genuine. As I say, it's not a kind of a sort of simple, straightforward uh, account, you have to do a lot of probing, it would be very atypical sleep disorder thing mm. to happen, or an unusual form of epilepsy, as I've mentioned. I've read once about a case of so called acquired paedophilia. Mm -hmm. Right. So that one where there, there, there was uh, a sort of a, a brain tumour this person had that had led to sexual urges towards children. They removed the tumour, the urges went away. Yes. Tumour came back, the urges came back, they removed the tumour again, the urges went away. Mm. Um, of course, an incredibly rare case, unique as far as I know. Do you, do you agree with the principle, the principle that sometimes a defendant can get up in court and say, I have this neurological condition, for whatever reason it, it made me commit a crime, so I should receive reduced punishment or be let off? Yeah, so that's, I guess that's, that's the, the, the interesting point, and I come back to my, my reply to the, the lady earlier, is that um, uh, you're not often let off because the insane mm. automatism, if untreatable, is still a very dangerous thing to have. Mm. So, um, Simon Wesley, who was a former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, was um, shipped over to Norway to um, be an external uh, observer for the Brevik trial. And Simon afterwards wrote an editorial for Lancet saying, There's this myth that um, 
if a serious crime happens, you have to be mentally ill. And secondly, psychiatry's job is to get you off. <laughs> I guess the second point is, is not the case. And people who are found to be, let's say, severely mentally ill or even neurologically ill may suffer longer incarceration and restrictions on their freedom. You would say it's the amount of treatment versus punishment. As I say, a lot of actual service users may choose um, to uh, decline medical expertise. So I suppose I'm, I'm misunderstanding the threat in a way. In that my sort of intuitive thought was that, oh, as neuroscience and psychiatry progresses, increasingly defendants will just say, oh, my brain, my brain made me do it, let me off, give me a reduced sentence. Mm -hmm. Maybe actually the threat is a bit different, that increasingly we'll find defendants, whether they like it or not, being found to have a particular neurological or psychiatric condition and being sucked into kind of indefinite treatment of that condition yes. rather than anything like the justice system as we know it. And also kind of stigmatising concern. So, again, people with mental health problems particularly, they, they will want the right to be able to have the full range of human experience, not to have it stuck in a pathology box. They should be allowed to make mm. choices wherever they are, whether they're feckless, criminal, wise, right. etc. I mean, that's kind of how it played out yeah. in the Breivik case, right? That mm. Part of his sort of mentality is that he wanted to be found sane. Exactly. Wanted it to be recognised as, as a genuine intention to kill. Um, so yeah, I guess it doesn't quite easily map on medicine mm. versus good outcome versus what the pe person, the patient dependent wants. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating, yeah, that it, it, it's very much not that the, that the criminal wants to be let off by virtue of having a psychiatric condition. Mm. It can be quite the opposite. And I guess one point, if it's okay Jonathan, just, I mean, mm. I guess the courts are more sensitive to the fact that prisons are, uh, sensitive trying to say are not good places. So I guess one thing we know clinically obviously is that prison population have high rates of mental health problems and they get worse. So it's the kind of moral argument that sometimes the courts bring in is that somebody with pre-existing mental illness, they wouldn't want to have a further custodial sentence to make them get sicker. So there's a kind of, there is that moral resistance sometimes with prison as well. It raises the, the big question in a way of what we think prisons and punishments are actually for. If we think that for every crime there is a neurological or psychiatric story about why it was committed and that the best way to prevent that sort of thing happening again would be to try and treat the, mm. the condition rather than exacting retribution on the criminal. It seems to fundamentally change what we think the justice system is. Mm. It almost makes you raise the question of why we have prisons at all as opposed to just lots and lots of psychiatric. Yeah. I think that's a, a, a fair point. I think certainly any psychiatrist who works in a prison is, is a very busy person because they are, in effect, mm. psychiatric units. There's a lot of mental health problems there that require, mm. require care. But I take it the system is not really geared up to that. No. that we, we think of it as being about punishment. Yeah, I mean, that relates, I guess, to one of the reasons why we're here is that people, to be praised or blamed, requires you have a free choice. And those kind of ideas of retribution, punishment, uh, don't seem to make much common sense if you remove the ideas of free choice so much. And let's bring in Noura and, and Helen on this. I mean, Helen, obviously philosophers, one of the reasons philosophers care so much about free will is that it's taken to be closely related to, to moral responsibility and then moral responsibility closely related to, to legal criminal responsibility. Yes, that's right. Um, I guess most people would think of free will at least as a sort of necessary condition for moral responsibility. Um, though I think probably not a sufficient condition actually. There, there are other, other things that have to be in place before one can be regarded as morally responsible for something. Um, I mean, uh, Matthew alluded earlier to, uh, you know, knowing what you're about is, is also very important. You have to have a certain level of mm -hmm. intelligence. Uh, we're going to come on later, I know, to animals. That's going to be relevant there. Um, but obviously the two are related. Um, I suppose, though, I, the way I think about the connection between free will and moral responsibility is that there are lots of questions about whether there's such a thing as free will that are absolutely independent of the question whether there's such a thing as moral responsibility and in a way it's quite a good idea yeah. to treat them separately in some ways you know there's an issue about whether there is such a thing 
as agency at all or whether it's all bottom-up determination of everything we do by the machinery within us if you like that's that's one question and then even if you think you've established that there is such a thing as agency there's then a, a further question about how it relates to moral responsibility because even if there is agency it might be very influenced by all sorts of societal forces emotional forces mm -hmm. And then there's the question, well, given there's that degree of influence, what, what degree of moral responsibility can we be said to have? So it's, I think the connections are very complicated. So even if we do have free will, there, there might be various ways in which we're not always fully responsible for what we do. Yes, I mean, I think, I think that's my view. I do, I do believe we have free will. But what I mean by that is something that's, that I believe is consistent with the idea that, you know, a lot of cases, many cases, we can't be said to have moral responsibility of the sort of absolute sort that I think some people have hoped we might have. Um, I think that probably is a, a bit of a chimera. Yeah, let's come back to that later in relation to animals, because right? if you think some animals have free will, it raises the question of whether they can be held morally responsible. Whether, whether your, your dog is responsible for eating your homework. <laughs> the, the answer's no. <laughs> but I mean, Nora, what's your take on this? I mean, I suppose as a neuroscientist, to some extent, you're, you might feel far removed from that, the ramifications of all this for the law and the justice system. Is this something you... Uh, no, I, th I think they are quite relevant. I think, uh, in fact, the, the research, um, I think it can uh, have things to, to contribute. Uh, to indeed refining notions of moral responsibility. Uh, I think uh, what, what seems interesting is to try to see how would research on decision making and on volition and on agency help us to find better ways to structure our legal systems, our societal systems that are consistent with how people actually make decisions and also uh, experience their own agency. So in, in legal cases, there often makes a big difference uh, the aspect of volition. So in, in a murder case, for example, if the person is said to have intended to kill uh, the person, the penalty will be very different and the case, uh, the trial will be very different from an accidental uh, murder. Um, so there it seems like what people report to be their sense of agency uh, and their sense of intention uh, in, in performing the action makes a big difference for how uh, the case is handled. And so then that raises a question, um, I think, of how our own awareness of our decision making and of our actions and of the control we have of our actions, uh, whether that has uh, something to contribute to uh, that discussion. Um, and also whether it has something to contribute, yeah, more to the way that we uh, <clears throat> perhaps structure society if we find that uh, we can <coughs> possibly learn to be better agents, uh, more responsible agents or more sociable um, agents, then it seems that there's a, a, a bit of a moral responsibility from the part of the society mm -hmm. uh, to both help through education and, and then also through things like rehabilitation uh, after people have uh, committed crimes rather than just punishment um, or mm. just desert or even uh, praise yeah. but which isn't directed or, or related to anything else uh, just for the sake of the moral uh, deserve. Yeah, um, that sort of theme is coming back uh, over and over again. I mean, Joshua Green is quite prominently argued that right. when, when, you have, when you understand the newer science of agency, what falls away is the idea that people really deserve punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, what you get instead is this idea that, that criminals are, are to be viewed as kind of targets of rehabilitation. Right? You know, of course we might still need a prison system, but it should be more aimed at uh, correcting whatever psychiatric condition led them to do what they did rather than... Not just psychiatric uh, condition, I think there's a danger there of also pathologizing too much the problems uh, because I mean psychology and sociology and history uh, uh, mm. have long uh, showed us how many things can influence how people <coughs> will make decisions and uh, and the sort of uh, worlds people grow in 
the social uh, and socioeconomic uh, mediums that people uh, grow in do constrain, uh, even if they don't determine, but they might somewhat constrain. So neuroscience adds uh, new, uh, maybe extra information, uh, but it's not necessarily radically different from, from what has already been uh, mm -hmm. said. And then also, again, the issue of, of the sort of uh, social responsibility of, of helping uh, helping people be better uh, rather than uh, expecting everything to uh, work out perfectly uh, just because mm. people have free will or something like that. Uh, so putting responsibility just on the people um, to get over all of their circumstances. And I think that's another issue of the legal system are also considering things like diminished responsibility, which is uh, seeing how those things can factor in pe to people's uh, behavior, mm. um, and then rehabilitation as a way to. Right. I mean, let's now take some questions from the audience on this topic of when neuroscience and psychiatry of free will meet the law. Um, it looks like we have a question from the, the very end of the second row from the front, and then we'll go back to the third row. We'll take another a group of three questions again. If that's all right. Hi, um, it's not really related to the law, and I don't have a long explanation like all the other adults, <laughs> but um, what you were saying earlier about bias and education fixing that bias, do you think that could eradicate racism? So that's all my question. Okay, thanks. And a, a question from the row behind, fourth uh, along. Yep. But Thank you very much for that. So I've got a I've got a question about the scientific enterprise and the importance of the scientific enterprise towards the discourse of free will and why it's very important. Because I see that there are two scopes or two realms. One is the brain and the other are the consequences. And the question is, can we model, and I think we can model, uh, the brain at some simplistic level using quantum mechanics. So we have these many, many different ways of potentialities that can exist in a probabilistic way. And then the question is, is the, the consequences are more on a macro level. And, and then the question is, can we marry the deterministic embedded within some cultural fabric or some sort of representation with the quantum representation, which is at the brain level? So you do have some free will, well, I don't know about free will, you certainly have some patterns uh, or resistances to a certain patterns at the quantum, at the, uh, the brain level, but then it gets instantiated. There, there's an observation that gets made, and you perform a particular action, and that becomes at the macro level. So I'd like to hear. Thanks, and, and from the row in front. I'd like to ask Nura, can you detect impaired free will, namely in people like uh, people with obvious psychopathic traits or OCD or perhaps even autism? Can you, do their characteristics when they're making decisions make them different from the general population? Great, thanks. Yeah, so interesting questions about whether the neuroscience and psychology of agency could help fight racism and whether, whether quantum representations of the brain are, are relevant here to your kind of work, Neuro, and whether, whether someone who has impaired free will behaves differently in a way that you can track. I mean, would you like to... Right. Um, yeah, I might start from, from the end, uh, just with recency. So um, I think at the moment we cannot say that we can tell uh, in any concrete way whether people have any of these disorders that you've mentioned and specifically how that changes. So of course there are many studies looking at how several uh, disorders, psychiatric disorders or neurodevelopmental disorders can change how people make decisions. But that's, that tends to be by comparing different groups. And so then statistically, we tend to find groups of uh, patients of this sort uh, might make different decisions from, uh, from healthy uh, people. Uh, but that poses a big problem of how to, if we just find one person uh, and we ask them some questions or we look at their brains, we, at least at the moment, don't have the tools to be able to say that the decision made by this one particular person, how that fits um, into the range of decisions that are made. Because of course, 
people within the healthy population will have a various uh, distribution of decisions that they might make mm. and behaviors, as will people with different kinds of disorders. So um, it, I don't know if we ever will reach a, p a point in which that is possible. Uh, because there will be variability uh, in, in, in many ways. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, in some cases, I think, take into account people's diagnoses and how that will, again, have, uh, might push them towards some tendencies of making decisions in one particular way or another. Um, mm. And, yes. I mean, Matthew, the, the mm. specific examples of autism spectrum conditions yeah. and... and psychotic spectrum conditions that were raised. Are these conditions that in some sense undermine free will or not? What do you think? I wouldn't have framed them in that way myself, but when people look at the neuroscience of moral reasoning, they frequently use those case studies as ways to investigate it, so that's completely correct. Whether it's about facial processing or, or theory of mind or, or what have you. I guess, and Nura might, might, might comment on this, but I guess my, what, what I guess is interesting to me from that is that the kind of neural uh, substrate of these processes, it's not as if there's a kind of moral reasoning module. So a lot of these bits of the brain that are working in certain ways work on decision making more, more widely. Um, so I guess I wouldn't probably see anybody with autism or, or psychopathy as, as having more or less free will, but more a different world or experiences. They'd live in different affordances or stimuli or cues they'd be sensitive to. I suppose in relation, I guess, to Helen's point, they might just have different um, uh, reasons they're receptive to, as, as, as Pierre said, in, in some ways. Yes. Nora, um, did you want to comment on this, on the quantum question? It's on often, the quantum it's question. It's often suggested that quantum physics is more friendly to free will than classical physics. Uh, but it just leads me to wonder, is, is it that your, your work just operates on a completely different level where whether the underlying system is quantum or not just makes no difference? Or, or could it be relevant in some way? I find it very hard to see how it could be relevant, at least for the uh, level of our work. Uh, but um, also, I think some, some people have argued that uh, even uh, indeterminacy at the quantum level doesn't necessarily provide much escape for free will because it would be random. Uh, and randomness isn't necessarily guided uh, by reasons or anything necessarily relevant to the person. So that might not be your point. Um, but otherwise, I think it's really difficult to see how these various levels interact. Already, we, there's quite a lot of issues of how in psychology and neuroscience, we bridge the levels of explanation of the mental terms when we talk about uh, things like experience, our experience of consciousness, or our experience of free will, and how that would ever translate, understanding how that can translate to uh, lower levels of explanation, like neuron firing, and then even lower levels at the uh, quantum level. It, these are our big challenges, I think, for, for science to find how to bridge these various uh, gaps. Um, so at the moment, I don't know really much much more to say. Um, well, I mean, in that, in that case, let's move on to, to Helen's work on free will in non-human animals. I mean, an assumption, I suppose, going back to Descartes, if not earlier, in a lot of the philosophical debate is that when we talk about free will, we're talking about a human capacity. It sets us apart in some way from the, the clockwork of the rest of the natural world. You think that's all wrong? I don't think it's all wrong. Um, one thing I ought to say, I think, to start with, is that I think that term free will is terribly loaded with all kinds of connotations that have been built in over certainly the last, I don't know, three or four centuries anyway. Um, and we tend to associate with free will um, some really quite advanced capacities for deliberative thought, for well thought out choice, for reasoning abilities. And so when I say animals have free will, in fact, I wouldn't say animals have free will, but if, if someone were to characterize my view as a view on which animals have free will, I wouldn't be wanting any of that baggage to come along. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to be ascribing to animals, um, you know, willy-nilly, as it were, that the capacity for sophisticated deliberative thought, reasoning, all, the, all those sorts of things. What I've 
the word that I've used, which I find quite helpful to describe my view, is actually agency, which I used before, um, because I don't think that does have all that baggage <laughs> coming along with it. Um, what I've tried to argue is that from a sort of evolutionary point of view, we ought to recognise that we are on a continuum with other forms of animal life. Um, and so that whatever it is that we go in for in the way of um, thinking, choosing, deciding what to do can't be that different um, from what certainly other, say, other primates um, and so on um, go in for in the way of choosing, decision-making and so on. That we ought to think about our agency in that context and try to get away from <coughs> the Cartesian picture where, you know, we're made in the image of God. The way in which we function is utterly different from the way in which uh, all, all the other all the other animals function, and try and think of ourselves as part part of that broader picture. So, how how far are you going across the biological world in attributing agents? How about ants? Uh. Well, it's a matter of degree. I think it's a matter of degree. I, I had two case studies in my book. Um, it's interesting you chose ants. Mine were spiders and earthworms, mm -hmm. because I think that's where people's intuitions really start to, you know, where pressure gets put on your intuitions. I think quite a lot of be people will be prepared to say of primates, of dolphins, of elf elephants, dogs. Um, yeah, they're agents of a kind. You know, they, they make certain choices. They're a type they they engage in a type of uh, of, of thinking they decide, uh, they decide. Uh, I think many people are not too uh, perturbed by that suggestion but then um, you you get simpler and simpler and I think roundabout spiders earthworms that kind of level is where I start to think mm, not sure but actually so I, I read up about spiders and about earthworms and one of the things I realized in doing that reading is that those sorts of creatures are much more sophisticated than one might think and uh, in fact they have capacities that one wouldn't have dreamt that they have. Um, I mean I suppose they're, they're small, they're difficult to track, they're, they're not the sorts of objects that we observe over long periods of time but those who do observe them find actually that they're rather fascinating. Um, I could just give you an example. Um, this is the case of a, of a particular kind of spider called the jumping spider, which preys on other spiders. Um, and it has this technique, so um, it, m it mimics the struggles of a sort of trapped insect at the edge of the web of the spider that it's trying to eat. Um, and um, this spider was observed doing this. Uh, it's having some trouble. The prey spider uh, is a bit aggressive towards it. It seems to have realized it's a spider, not a trapped fly. So after a little while with experimenting with this, with this technique, this particular spider moves away from the web uh, and goes on a journey, a detour, it which takes about an hour, takes it out of view of the prey spider, and it appears on a rock projection above the spider it wants to eat, lets itself down, swings in, takes the spider out of the web, and eats it. And what, what that says to me is, you know, that spider, in a sense, had a plan. You know, it understood the spatial uh, kind of environment it was in. It figured out that a, a journey would take it to a position from which it could enact its plan, swing down and eat the spider. I think that's astounding, and it it's vastly superior to anything I would have expected a spider to be able to do in advance of having read that article. So I suppose I've been, I've been affected by seeing what in fact these creatures are able to do if one just looks into it. They're not as simple as you might think. So you're one over to the idea of agency in spiders. The, the spiders, yes. Um, or at least those spiders. Those spiders. It may be that other species are... Not so, not so fancy, but... So, it, so this is a property that may well have evolved more than once. 
because you think spiders have it, we have it, but not everything has it. Yes, I mean, the way I think of agency is as a capacity for discretion, which is useful to many kinds of creature. In particular, uh, it's very useful to creatures which have to move about in order to find, to find food, to find mates, uh, to escape from predators and so on. Um, the spatial environment's very complex. It offers alternatives. You can go this way, you can go that way. What's going to survive well in environments like that? I think what's going to survive well is creatures that are very good at taking in new information and responding to it in a flexible way. Um, not a creature that's got lots of deterministic programs ready to go. Deterministic programming can only go so far. Makes Once me wonder how we um, distinguish this sort of thing from what bacteria do. Bacteria are pretty flexible in some ways. They can move around along Well, and things like that. Well, okay, like so that I did think about uh, paramecia. Uh, so paramecia are little single-celled organisms, and they can indeed move about. They have little cilia on the outside. Uh, they move around uh, with, with these cilia. But in fact, you can predict where a paramecium is going to, to go uh, using a few. The, I mean, the research is really early. It's the 1930s. Um, so the pH of water matters. Uh, the temperature of the water matters. Uh, and maybe light is, I can't remember, there's a third factor. Um, but within very close limits, you can predict where a paramecium is going to so travel. It's unpredictability that's crucial for you? Is no, not, not unpredictability as such. The, the thing that I think, I, I mean, unpredictability is a consequence of the thing that I think is important, which is what I call the capacity to settle moment to moment what you're going to do. Um, not in not in respect of absolutely every variable. I mean, it's pretty much settled now that I'm not going to, you know, get up and stomp out of the room. <laughs> that, that's that's not in my range of options. Um, that's that's kind of ruled out for me. Um, but nevertheless, within a within a range of options, you know, there there's all sorts of things that I might say um, in the next few minutes, and I will determine. I want to say which of them. Um, is going to be sad. So it's something about the, the cause coming from within or something like that? The, 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 the range of options, nothing outside causes which one to be taken. Something inside the spider's brain causes which I one is taken. I wouldn't say inside because I, I worry that that's to perpetuate dangerous ideas of what, what we in? are. Top down is, is the way I would want to put it. Mm. So I think we are we are sort of hierarchical systems. Animals are hierarchical systems. There are, you know, there are the cells, there are the tissues, there are the organs, there are the subsystems, and then there's the whole animal. That's to say, that's us. We're we're the whole, um, and causal relations go both ways, from bottom to top, and I think this is what we have to remember from top to bottom as well. Uh, there are lots of models of humanity, the mechanistic ones, which deny that top-down direction, and that's what I think the mistake is. Both directions exist, and I think having free will is a matter of the, the top-down causation being given um, Say a bit more about what you role. mean by that. What, what is the top, and what is it causing? So the top is, as I've said, the whole, the whole animal. Um, I mean, I think... In a way, it should be fairly obvious that we do have top-down control over our brains. I mean, you used that phrase, my brain made me do it. I want to say, no, no, my brain didn't make me do it. My brain's just an organ, it's not me. It's an organ like the liver is or the kidney is. It's a very, very important organ for lots of the things we think most precious and crucial about human beings. But it, it, at the end of the day, it's an organ. Um, and. When I, when I talk about top-down control, what, I, what I'm talking about is the capacity of the individual that is the animal to have an impact on what's going on um, at, the, at the lower levels. Um, 
you know, you, you raised your arm earlier on. In order for your arm to go up as a result of your choosing it to, you had to make things happen in your brain because, you know, those are the necessary antecedents of your arm going up. It shouldn't, I think, be controversial in a way that we can make things happen in our brains. It's clear that we can. So we may say, not... I made my brain do it. Well, you made your brain do it. That's right. <laughs> That's the way I would want to put it. Minura, what do you think of this? Because it seems on the face of it as if your approach to free will is a kind of bottom-up approach. You, you think what happens, at, what people do is to be explained in terms of what the neurons are doing in their, in their heads. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't quite say that. I mean, I think this notion of hierarchies, I think, is, is, is relevant. Uh, but there are also a lot of hierarchies within the brain. So, I mean, I would wonder sure. what this higher hierarchical level is besides the brain or if it's a f if it's a more integrative one then i guess i would also agree so the brain doesn't work independently of the body right so i also think one of the issues with uh the questions of free will is what the i means and so uh the i who made the decision mm. and so for some people the i is the conscious talking mm. that we do and they think that the conscious talking that we do that's the i um but that might be a problematic notion in itself, and then that becomes a question about what is a self and what is the I, and I think the I is more the combination of the being, uh, of their brain and of their body, and of the dynamic interactions uh, that are happening in that. Um, but yeah, so the brain also has lots of different hierarchies and how it is structured and how it interacts, uh, and the different levels uh, interact. So it does seem, Strange to say, I made my brain do it, um, because, I mean, it still seems to imply an I, which is different from the brain. Um, and I think that's one of the problems. Um, and if we don't worry about an I that is different from the brain and the body, the whole system together, um, then that doesn't become so problematic, because it's me who's making the decisions, uh, but just not a separate me, which is some other thing. Uh, it's me as the whole entity that I am. Um, I think that's that's my perspective, um, and but yes, I think I had a, a question uh, from what you were saying that it seems like the the critical aspect is an issue of complexity, how complex the problem is, uh, and the possibilities are, and so how, and how complex the being is, and how many different types of actions it can make, basically. Yes. And for, in terms of the, the animal question. Right. I just want to say that I totally agree with you that we have to resist the idea of the, as you put it, the separate eye. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, I think that's a very common picture. And anyone who says things like I've just said, you know, I made my brain do it, um, risks having that view attributed to them, but that's not what I mean. Um, the eye for me is the embodied animal, the whole embodied animal, uh, of which the brain is, as I said, a part, merely a part, although an extremely important part. Um, and so I think that there, there is a, um, there are top-down effects from whole embodied animal to brain. Um, and so that's when I say I did it, I mean whole embodied animal did it. I also had another question regarding the notion of determinism, um, because you seem to imply that, okay, very determined actions would be, for example, the bacteria going in some way because of the uh, uh, concentration uh, of nutrients or something like that. But that seems like a very narrow definition of determinism, or as in deterministic systems can have a lot of complexity in how they work. Uh, and 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 depend on probabilities uh, rather than have one-to-one -one mappings of this happens, that happens, uh, and therefore complexity isn't necessarily a problem uh, or inconsistent with deterministic uh, sequences of uh, actions. It's follow? quite true, of course, that you know determinism is perfectly compatible with complexity. My view is that determinism isn't compatible with agency. Um, I have tried to, to argue for that, that I think one of the things we, at least not with, it's not compatible, agency isn't compatible with philosopher's determinism, that's to say global, global determinism. Um, I think one of the things we 
think about our agency is that we settle things, as I've said before, that um, my actions don't trace back beyond me into the into the distant past you know that all their causes have already happened you know in the 16th century you know it could have been predicted if only someone had known all the particles their positions their motions all the laws governing them and so on that i would now be sitting here saying just this very thing at this very moment that conception of determinism i would want to say is inconsistent with agency and what, what's more it's absolutely incredible that anyone could believe in it it seems to me it's right. it's I a mean, fantastic picture and it's astonishing to me that many philosophers still today seem to think it's kind of it's the going view it's you know and th that also doesn't seem to me that compatible with determinism in physics because no. determinism in physics allows for a lot of uh randomness uh, and these probabilities which means you cannot predict the motion of a molecule uh, moving around even though it is all ruled by deterministic uh, interactions between the molecules but that does not mean that we would even be able to predict even if we knew all the rules of the world where that molecule is going to land um, so that's a very uh, yeah that's a peculiar view of determinism for philosophers Yes, <laughs> yes it is. It, and it does go back to that gentleman's right. question as well about the relevance of quantum quantum phenomena. Um, I mean, it, yeah. it, it always has... I mean, some people respond to the, th the so-called threat of determinism by saying, we don't have to worry because the world's indeterministic, isn't it? Isn't it? As, you know, as the physicists have told us. Um, to which I think it's a perfectly fair response to say that kind of indeterminism, it's just not obvious that that gives us, you know, that that's any help whatsoever. Um, what we need is a kind of indeterminism that really centers on agency and that makes it clear that we, being the sorts of beings we are, can make a difference to the world going forward. So it's not just sort of random quantum events that cause what we yeah, do. Yeah, that's hopeless. That's bottom up. Yeah, yeah. That's bottom up, so that's no good. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, so spiders with agency, this picture, it's fairly liberal in, in the sort of animals it attributes agency to, raises the question of what, if anything, might be distinctive about the kind of agency we have. Is it all just differences of degree? Or is there something special that evolved quite recently since humans broke away from the other great apes that marks out a special kind of agency we have? I think there is a very great deal that is special about human agency, um, for sure. I, I, mean, I wouldn't want to deny that for a minute. Um, I think w we probably, because of things that are connected with language and sociality and the very, very deep embeddedness of human beings in, in the social, um, that those things have um, allowed us to develop ways of reflecting on our, on our aims, on our ends, on the kinds of lives we want to lead, you know, um, to, to choose to lead lives that in many ways take us away from what one would have thought of as being, you know, our animal instincts. You know, we can choose to be celibate, we can choose to diet, we can choose, you know, we can choose uh, to act in all kinds of... So the spider's already got some flexibility, some options. It, 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 yes, more it's, options. It's, more, it's more flexibility, exactly. I mean, I do, I do think it is all about degree. The spider has some small, some small and insignificant choices. It seems it's very um, constrained by the life a spider has to le lead. It can't, it can't decide it's not going to bother spinning any webs. You know, it's just going to have a week off from spinning. You know, it's, that's not possible. <laughs> I, think, I guess um, our flexibility is relatively recent. I mean, like people were spending the vast bulk of their time just catching food. I guess Analogously. that's right, that technology yeah. affects, affects flexibility yeah. as, as well as um, all sorts of other things that, you know, it, it, it does depend a little bit on, yeah, on the extent to which we're able to escape constraints mm. through technology of our own making. So um, some of these distinctively human features might be very, very recent indeed. You know, they might be since uh, we have civilization might not even have been there in, in early humans. I haven't thought about that. Um, I ought to think about it some more. It's a really interesting question, you know, uh, whether, 
whether the pro progress of civilization, mm -hmm. as it were, is, is, it, is increasing our capacity to our choices and so on. I'm inclined to think not because there's so many countervailing forces. <laughs> you know, there are, there are many ways in which I think people would say we're actually more hemmed in now than we, than we ever mm -hmm. have been. Um, but, you know, the capacity to make all this technology has a cost um, in terms of what we have to we have to live within you know the capitalist system which makes us um, work in particular ways we have to live in particular ways and perhaps that you know so uh, Matthew you wanted to as you're talking about spiders I was trying to think of how non-animal agency so is I mean I was trying to think about I guess one level kind of Aristotelian ideas of teleology in nature yes and then also about artificial intelligence whether that you mentioned deterministic bottom-up programming but I guess my meeting before I came here was around um, AI and clinical consultations in mental health mm -hmm. so it kind of chimed me slightly that you could maybe there can be flexibility complexity um, a teleological approach to an artificial in artificial intelligence that could have the agency you're, you're talking about Helen so it's been interested to see if this is a animal non animal thing or whether you're, you're liberal to extend it beyond animal as it were so what I, what I would say about that is that I, I think there's no reason in principle to insist that um, there couldn't be agents of a non-biological kind. Um, I don't think we know. I don't think we know the answer to that yet. I do think that nothing that has yet been produced that isn't biological is an agent. And the reason I would want to say that is because I, you know, I, I would resist the idea that it's um, only about um, complexity. Mm -hmm. um, I would want to say that this, this thing I'm calling settling is really important, and that's what I think, you know, no artificial machine, at least thus far, has got. You know, you can build in a sort of randomizing choice module or something. Um, so that there is some indeterminacy in what a, a machine will, will do, but it won't be up to the machine. <laughs> um, it will be either up to its program or it will be random, and that's really different. Well, not necessarily. You're not no. learning, yeah. Yes, machines are learning more and more to choose, make their own choices, uh, even but inspired somewhat but by decision-making models. what does that mean, models. its own choice? That's what I'm... Well, choices that allow them to achieve the goals that they've set uh, themselves, possibly not even necessarily set by the programs, but that go further and further from their original mm. programming, and it's also not just a randomized... Uh, module um, but that is driven by learned behaviors uh, and uh, you know reinforcement histories um, and and so on which then offers complexity that and flexibility in the decision making also I would still feel that isn't enough um, that it's yes it's going to be that you know yes there's going to be uh, learning and yes, there's going to be flexibility and complexity such that it might eventually become unpredictable, you know, what the what the um, AI is going to is going to choose. But I still feel there's an account um, to be given if we could only know it of a, a bottom up account. Um, Don't worry that about the spider. I mean, what, what if the, we could have a robot that does exactly what the spider does? Um, I rather doubt that we're that far away from, from having that sort of... Well, I guess it would, be, it would be a consequence of my view that there couldn't be one, <laughs> in fact, that was, you know, right, that was exactly... That so was that's kind exactly of a good comparable. empirical prediction mm -hmm. there that we'll, we'll see borne out yeah. over yeah. the next hundred years. It'd be great to take a couple of final questions from the audience on all of this. Um, let's have one from the second row here, um, and then we'll go back. Thank you. <coughs> Some of the things that have been said, perhaps particularly in relation to the uh, top-down dimension, remind me of a couple of quotations that I think have been attributed to Jung. Um, I believe he said that <coughs> everybody has an individual myth which she or he needs to live. And um, I think he also said that free will is the ability to do what one must do willingly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're talking about animals and biological systems. 
a couple of observations, and then I'll link it through with, with the question. Um, the human body is not just the brain. We have neurons in the heart, in the stomach, and in the bowels. We actually exist as a complex system that's feeding backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Item number one. Item number two is that biological, ecological systems, particularly with plants, plants can't live without fungi. Fungi actually link all plants between a different network. And we're beginning to see, certainly plant scientists are seeing that if you affect one part of an ecology, plants and the other parts of the ecologies are getting signals through that. The third thing is back to the artificial intelligence. Google recently had its deep mind play number uh, version three, interact with its deep mind version number two, and they only switched it off, uh, I think it was in January, because they thought that the two computer programs were inventing a language talking between them. So they switched that off. So one of the thoughts I had was in terms of agency and in terms of what this self and this agent is, is that there is something around the complexity and complex systems, particularly where in systems that can't be broken down hierarchically. I mean hierarchic systems is where you can determine everything from the minute part, so everything's analytical. Certain systems, particularly, I, I, I suspect, biological systems and now learning systems in computing cannot be broken down in that way. So if that is the case, then does that mean that we will have intelligent machines that will have free will? Because if you're arguing that uh, biological systems have a level of agency, then ultimately I cannot see how the software systems will not have a similar level of agency. Thank you. Thoughts on both questions from Helen, perhaps? Yes. Um, I do think it's about, I, I do think interconnectedness is, is extremely important. Um, I mean, I, when I was using the word hierarchical, I didn't mean to suggest what I think you, you meant to suggest when you were talking about, or you used the word analytical. In a way, I, I, I want to deny that. I want to, I want to say, yes, we're hierarchical systems in that there are, there are levels, as I said, things, you know, there's the cell level, tissues, organs, uh, the, whole, the whole animal level. But I do want to say that in a sense, well, I think this is what you're saying too, um, there are emergent properties, as it were, out of the complexity at the at the higher levels that one could not predict from um, the properties of the lower. I, I think that's right. I think that's a phenomenon that we see uh, right across the biological sphere is that you do have this uh, emergent level and I think agency is in that in that sense an emergent property. I've been much more skeptical I guess about whether agency would emerge from um, complex systems of non-biological sorts um, though as I said I wouldn't want to you know I don't want I don't want to rule it out I just think we I don't think we know <laughs> um, at the moment we don't know enough about the ways in which biology is special um, my instinct is that as I said we haven't got there yet but perhaps what you've been telling me about you know deep mind uh, and deep mind too, um, communicating with each other. Perhaps, perhaps I'm just mistaken about exactly how far things have got. Um, that might be right. Matthew, did you want to comment on this? Well, I guess I was thinking about your your first part. You talked about the spider. You said I didn't think it, this was going to have agency. And then you read, and you thought this is now possible. And I guess I wonder with the example of uh, technology, and I guess also aliens. Is there an agency we haven't got the imagination to spot, or the capacities to notice? Yes. So there's a failure of imagination in our own epistemological processes yes, so yes. that's that, that could might be, a, well be true yeah there might be as it were higher level <laughs> agents that we aren't spotting just as there are lower level ones that we aren't spotting I mean I <clears throat> uh, it would seem to me that ideally one would want to come up with a definition of agency which I mean either there are some sort of natural kinds or some types of entities that can have it or not 
Otherwise, if it's <coughs> an issue, a sort of functionalist issue, that it achieves some particular uh, goals, it makes actions, it behaves in particular ways, it has particular capacities, then it would seem like whichever system would tick those boxes should be considered an agent, um, right? Uh, un unless one does not want to make it about a question of uh, a functional uh, description of a system, um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I yeah. Because then there's the, might be the question of whether it is observed or not that such functions can be achieved in non-biological beings, um, but that becomes a secondary question if the main question is just coming up with a list of uh, mm. properties needed. I think that's a really big and important question that you've raised, whether one ought to try for a functional definition of agency, as you put it, and say, well, an agent's just got to be able to do these things. Uh, and when we've got something that can do these things, that's an agent. Or whether it's what philosophers might call a natural kind, mm -hmm. whether there's a type of system that we're cognitively attuned to that... Is essentially biological and that cannot be defined by the um, by by the by a list of criteria. I think that's a really interesting question, an interesting methodological mm -hmm. question about where you know where to begin this discussion from. I think a lot of people have gone the functionalist route. I'm not sure that is the way to go, um, but yeah, I think it's a very deep and important question. With, um with AI is that it will be conscious and have free will a long time before we notice <laughs> or believe that it is. Yes, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Yes. Um, so I wanted to close by asking you, yes or no, do we have free will or not? I, <laughs> I suspect that you'd probably all say yes. I think I it depends yes. on the definition. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's it's it, it's this is not an yes or no. Uh, yes or no question. <laughs> I guess so. Um, Helen, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Good oh. news. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's the majority saying yes. Great. Well, thanks very much for coming, and let's thank our panel for a really. Fun